Hello, B here, and welcome back to Biology. Have you ever wondered what it means when you hear humans referred to as Homo sapiens? Or how we ended up with this fancy scientific name? It's not just us humans either. All living things have a scientific name. How about Solanum tuberosum, the potato, or Carica papaya, the papaya? Throughout this lesson, we will be looking at how these scientific names relate to the ways we classify living things. But before we get started, let's look at our goals for this lesson. By the end, you'll be able to list the hierarchical categories for how scientists name organisms, define taxonomy, species, and morphology. Compare and contrast changes in taxonomy over the past 150 years. Let's start this lesson with an important question. Why would a new species evolve from an existing species? Think back to our previous lessons on evolution. We know that speciation often occurs through natural selection, which results in populations becoming more adapted to their environments. A perfect example of this is the long neck of a giraffe. Giraffes with longer necks survived because they could reach leaves higher up on the trees. Well, at some point, this advantageous trait evolves so much that the new population no longer looks like the original. This is when it is determined that the surviving animal is actually a new species. Taxonomy is how we name these new species. Taxonomy is defined as the process of organizing, classifying, and naming living organisms. To do this, we use a hierarchy or system for ranking things. There are eight levels in the taxonomic hierarchy that take us from least to most specific. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Are you wondering how you will ever remember this order? It's easy. Dear King Philip came over for good soup. The first letter of each word is the first letter of each classification level. Can you think of another mnemonic device to help you remember the order? Go ahead and pause the video so that you can record your own mnemonic device in the lesson notes. When you look at a chart that shows these taxonomic hierarchies, you will see that there are a lot more living organisms at the top than at the bottom. That is because the most broad classification is domain, which is at the top. The three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes, or living organisms that don't contain a nucleus. Since the domains archaea and bacteria contain microscopic organisms and are not classified in the same detailed way, we will be focusing on the domain eukarya. These organisms are composed of eukaryotic cells, meaning they contain a nuclear membrane and therefore a contained nucleus. Under the classification of domain eukarya, there are four kingdoms, animalia, fungi, plantae, and protista. Each kingdom has its own characteristics. Most of the examples we are discussing in this lesson fall under the kingdom animalia, which contains many phyla, classes, orders, families, genera, which is the plural of genus, and species. Each of these classification levels provide important characteristics that apply to each specific animal, from the domain all the way down to the species. A species is the most specific level in the taxonomic hierarchy. By definition, two animals of the same species can breed together and produce fertile offspring. This means that their offspring can produce more offspring. For example, a dog, Canis lupus, the genus Canis refers to animals that typically have large canine teeth, highly developed skulls, and short legs compared to their body. 
If you go a little further up the taxonomic chart, you will see that dogs are also a member of the class Mammalia, which includes animals that have hair or fur, are warm-blooded, are born alive, and female animals in this class produce milk to feed their young. Wolves are also part of the species Canis lupus. Since that means dogs and wolves are the same species, they can breed together and produce fertile offspring, a wolf dog. How about a liger? Lions, Panthera leo, and tigers, Panthera tigris, are from the same genus, Panthera, but different species. When they breed together, they produce an offspring, a liger. Since the parents are different species, which is true? A. The liger will only live approximately one year. B. The liger will be able to breed and produce offspring, but only with other ligers. C. The liger will not be able to breed and produce offspring. If you said C, you are correct. A liger is unable to breed and produce offspring because it is an infertile offspring of two different species. Let's look at another example in Kingdom Animalia. How about the Indo-Pacific gecko, or Hemidactylus garnati? These animals are in the same phylum, Chordata, as dogs, but diverge at that point to a different class, Reptilia. The phylum Chordata is characterized by a nervous system and a backbone. Animals such as salamanders, humans, dogs, cats, sharks, and pandas all fall under the phylum Chordata. As we move down to class Reptilia, fewer of these animals fall under that category. Animals in class Reptilia are cold-blooded, have dry, rough skin, and have bodies covered in scales. Remember, the further down the classification levels that two species diverge, the more closely those species are related. For example, a dog and a jackal share the same genus, Canis, but a dog and a gecko only go as far as sharing the same phylum, Chordata. This tells me that a dog is more closely related to a jackal than to a gecko. Think back to all of the scientific names we have reviewed in this video. Do you notice a pattern? Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish biologist in the 18th century, developed the process of naming organisms using their genus and species, as well as how they are written. The entire name is written in italics, and the genus is capitalized while the species is not. Let's look at a few more examples, including a few that we have already discussed in today's lesson. Hemidactylus garnati, Canis lupus, Tyrannosaurus rex, Elephus maximus. Sometimes you will see the genus name abbreviated, however, the species name is never abbreviated. So, when writing the scientific name for a dog, you can write either Canis lupus or C. lupus. Although we still use this naming convention, scientific advancements have really changed how we approach taxonomy since Carl Linnaeus first developed it. When he began classifying organisms, he didn't have genetic testing and DNA testing like we have today. Instead, he used physical traits that he could see, like size, shape, color, and body structure. Using these details to classify organisms is called morphology. There are some limitations of using only morphology to classify organisms. Can you think of some? Pause the video here and record your thoughts in your notes. Some limitations include some organisms go through multiple life stages. For example, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Some specimens that are found are too small to use only morphology to identify. Some species are so similar that it is almost impossible to tell them apart. For example, the northern leopard frog and the southern leopard frog. What does this mean for taxonomy today? Well, today we use genetics to distinguish between different species and classify organisms. Let's look at an example. Which animal do you think is a closer relative to humans? Chimpanzees or gorillas? If you said chimpanzees, you are correct. 
Chimpanzees share approximately 98.5% of our DNA, while gorillas share approximately 96% of our DNA. This means that we are around twice as genetically related to a chimpanzee as we are to a gorilla. As we went through the lesson today, we learned how to write the scientific names of living organisms, discussed the hierarchy system of classifying living organisms, and saw how taxonomy has changed with new scientific advancements. In the lesson PDF, you'll have the chance to identify the full taxonomic name of three different organisms and learn how to use a dichotomous key to identify a living organism. Next time, you'll have the chance to review what we learned in Unit 7, Evolution, and demonstrate your knowledge in a unit assessment. Until next time, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. Hey, hey.